Welcome to another edition of The Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. This is our 125th show. Today's guest is Dr. Shamin Prashatham, author of Gorillas Can Dance, which I love that title. Uh, Shamin, start with telling us about your background. Well, Mark, it's great to be on your award-winning show. Congratulations on your uh, recent couple of awards. And uh, thank, you. Thank, you for, uh, thank you for uh, having me on. So my origins are South Asian. I was born to an Indian father and a Sri Lankan mother. My very early years were spent in the Midwest, in the US actually, in Columbus, Ohio. Um, my parents were at grad school and then they decided to return to India where they were involved with an NGO, a mental health NGO. My mother is no more, but my father is still active there and they recently had a, a golden jubilee celebration. So that's uh, been a long time commitment. I myself, moved to the UK over a couple of decades ago um, and uh, became a business school academic. I did my PhD at a school in Glasgow, Scotland called Strathclyde University. And one of the interesting things there was you, um, my research was about how small companies were going international. So that was interesting to see. Uh, but I was also part of an international business unit which had made its reputations studying large multinationals. And there were many large US companies that had set up shop in Scotland over the years. Uh, and then as I was ending my doctoral studies, I began to ask, um, why were we looking at these big companies and small companies and silos? Was it not possible that they might be working together? And I just began to observe some examples of that in Scotland. And so as my PhD came to an end in 2005 and I became a full-time professor, uh, and as you know well, you, know, you continue to do research um, as part of what you do when you're an academic, I began to get interested in how smaller companies and large companies can work together. The other thing that was also interesting to me was what was going on in Asia. And uh, I ended up moving to China, which is where I'm speaking to you um, now. And uh, I teach at a business school in Shanghai called China Europe International Business School. And you said that's the oldest business school? In, uh, it's the oldest business school in China. It was uh, set up as a joint venture between the European Union and the Chinese government. Uh, and it was established in 94 and it was the first uh, MBA granting school in China. That's a wild considering how old China is and you would expect, uh, I was expecting right. to say, oh, it's a thousand years old or something. <laughs> um, right. But 26 years old, it's not even out of the womb barely at 26. Right, right, right. Um, why, why did you write this book? Uh, and again, I love the title and, and really love the book. Thank you. So um, as I said, I finished my PhD in 2005. In 2006, I began to observe a few examples of smaller companies partnering with large companies. And in the summer of 2006, I attended um, you know, one of these annual summer conferences that academics show up at. Uh, and there was this very distinguished professor who had uh, been given an award and there was a session for that. And at the end, during the Q&A, I mustered up the courage to say, you know, I'm a French freshly minted PhD, just starting my academic career. And I began to notice this phenomenon that some startups are seeking to partner with large multinationals. And uh, one of the reasons, of course, is that they were trying to expand and scale up, including internationally. Do you think this is an interesting phenomenon to try to study? And his reply was, uh, I don't think many of these smaller companies have a choice. They need to learn to dance with the big gorilla. And so that's how I got this phrase, dancing with gorillas. Initially started writing from the perspective of startups. So a couple of years later, I had an article called Dancing with Gorillas in California Management Review. And then just sort of stuck with this phenomenon. I kept examining this and it started bec uh, becoming a thing. By about 2015, many large companies themselves were starting to 
put out programs to engage with startups. And so it was as if the gorillas had begun to learn to dance. And then I started increasingly writing for a big company audience as well. Uh, and then it soon became apparent that these many big companies were looking for some guidance in terms of, you know, how do you do this thing? And I was lucky enough to have observed some of the companies that had gone and got into the act relatively early. Uh, and I felt I had something to say to managers in large companies that were trying to figure this out. And so that's what gave rise to this book, Gorillas Can Dance. Well, I mean, clearly there's a stat you have in the book uh, that says that 80% of employees of large companies feel their businesses are at risk. And I, I think that that's prevalent, I think, throughout the world, right, for really large companies, because once you work for a large company and so much of your time is taken walking around with a coffee mug, going to meetings, <laughs> very little actually implementing uh, stuff that it scares you about where it's going. And then, of course, you read about startups that are, are going to gobble your lunch if you don't make adjustments in your game. So I thought uh, that statistic of 80% of employees, I mean, that's going to be scary to the leaders, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that comes from a McKinsey study. 80% uh, of the, the informants or the respondents in that study uh, were concerned that their business model was at risk. And I think that's exactly the starting point um, in terms of the why, the rationale for reaching out to startups is the recognition that First of all, companies, established companies need to be more entrepreneurial, more innovative um, because of the disruption they're facing. I think the digital revolution was a big part of this. I mean, it's, it's easy to sometimes uh, exaggerate the effect of disruption, but certainly it doesn't help to underestimate this. And so um, I think many companies have been recognizing the need to cope with uh, all the big changes to be more entrepreneurial. And one way to do that is to engage with entrepreneurship that's outside the boundaries of the company. Has COVID made a big change in the sense of um, a lot of the people 21 to 35 now really like working from home. Uh, it's a problem getting them to come back. How, how do companies build culture if people don't want to come in and be kind of wandering into each other and meeting with each other over coffee and lunch and, and so forth. How, how do you see that working and how's that gonna work for the large companies trying to work with these smaller companies? Yeah, I think that's a very, very important question and one that companies are grappling with. Um, incidentally, um, you know, at one point, um, China and Australia, which had these very strict lockdowns were among the first to be able to reopen um, the, their um, working environments. And so when Microsoft gave their employees the option of whether they wanted to work at home or come in, uh, this was back in um, either late 2020 or early 2021, they found that in Australia, 80% uh, of the employees took the uh, option of working from home, whereas in China, only 20% did, you know, 80% wow. still wanted to that? show up. Yeah, so I think, you know, that sort of speaks to your point that there is this great value that is still perce uh, perceived in terms of face-to-face -face communication uh, and interaction. And I think in a highly relational uh, society, that is um, all the more so. Uh, but I think with Western audiences, it's, it's a different story. I think people uh, love the, the, the option that they have, uh, the, the, the freedom that, um, or the flexibility that you get when you're able to work from home. But I think it's also uh, recognized that face-to-face -face contact can um, make a difference. So I think it's a little bit like what we were talking about a moment ago, which is, you know, you realize that things are changing, you need to adapt. But obviously, at the same time, you want to make sure that you leverage the capabilities you have, you know, that sort of tension between exploiting capabilities and exploring new ones. I think there will be a bit of a tension that uh, companies will work through, which is on the one hand, employees want flexibility. On the other, they do want this um, ability to have 
some face-to-face -face, uh, touch points. And I, I, I think, you know, this is a sort of an evolving picture. With regard to working with uh, startups on the outside, I think, again, uh, th there is a recognition that having been forced to go virtual, uh, many of the accelerator programs and so on actually were able to build in flexibilities that they didn't have before. We're able to bring in startups onto the program from you know, more far-flung kind of regions, uh, but they're also recognizing that without some level of face-to-face -face connection, you, you don't quite build a bond. So I think it's work in progress, figuring out that balance. I, I think working, I've been working from home even when I've run other ventures, at least two days a week. And I find it uh, a great relief to work out of the office and not be tangled up in meetings all day. So I kind of think that some compromise has got to be yeah. in the offing uh, for American companies, because mm. I think people feel that that would be uh, great for them, because I think they feel suffocated by these meetings and feel like they're like uh, on a, a treadmill they can't get off of. Uh, what's the hardest part of a partnership between a startup and a large company? Right. So, you know, if we say that the why of partnering with startups is very often the disruption and uh, the sort of thing, that then leads to the question of the how. But before you get to that, I, I think one of the key insights that I got from my research studying a bunch of companies in different parts of the world is they were all struggling with a common issue, uh, which I've come to call the paradox of asymmetry. So on the one hand, uh, there's great attraction in terms of engaging with startups for a big company because the big company and the startup, at least on paper, have complementary skill sets. Uh, the big company has scale, legitimacy, reputation, resources, whereas the startup has agility, speed, creativity, and so on. But the paradox is the very differences that make it attractive to work together also make it difficult or at least not straightforward to do so um, because they're just so different in terms of their goals, the timescales at which they're trying to pursue those goals, their organization structures, um, and you know, their ability to attract the attention of the other. Uh, and so this is what I think is the central challenge, the paradox of asymmetry. Uh, and I think the better companies and managers understand this, the, the nature of the asymmetry, the better they are able to then try and address those uh, challenges. Um, who's really done this well and what's the best formula for doing it? So, um, the company that I've studied the longest is Microsoft. I would say they're the lead case um, in my uh, book. Uh, but I also then was able to study companies like IBM, SAP, which is a, a big German uh, IT company, um, and then companies from more traditional sectors like Walmart in retail, Unilever in fast-moving consumer goods, BMW in automotive, Bayer in pharma. And I think all of these companies have actually uh, taken startup partnering fairly seriously. And so here's what I uh, observed, and this is a key part of the how uh, that I talk about in the book. In terms of addressing the asymmetry of goals, the important thing that these companies have done is to clarify the synergy. In relation to addressing the asymmetry of structure, the fact that it's normally very difficult to find role counterparts between a very big company and a tiny one. Uh, they created interfaces, uh, basically very specific identifiable structured units that startups could reach out to as their first port of call. And the third thing in terms of addressing this asymmetry of attention, which is, um, you know, the big company sees a, an ocean of startups out there, they aren't sure who to prioritize their limited managerial attention to. The startups, on the other hand, know who the big companies are, but struggle to find who within the company to get uh, the attention of who the right decision makers are. Uh, cultivating exemplars, uh, very intentionally developing early success stories, I found actually helped both sides to understand what success could look like and thereby 
prioritize their attention. So synergy interface exemplar, that's the sort of the uh, format of, of partnering that I found to be common across the ones that have, uh, the companies that have been doing this well. Uh, David Cohen, who wrote the forward, writes, part of the problem between startups and large companies is mindset, operating procedures, resources that corporations have within their DNA. Well, what's he talking about here? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm extremely grateful to, to Dave, David um, for providing the, the forward. And um, Techstars is a, a company in uh, Boulder, Colorado that uh, uh, developed an accelerator that's helped a lot of startups to, uh, to develop. It was, you know, trying to do this from outside of the Valley and has done this very successfully over many years. <laughs> And they were also very instrumental early on in Microsoft being able to think through um, its own startup partnering uh, activities and efforts. And I think what uh, that quote that you just uh, read out points to is, is very much around the asymmetries we're talking about. So many of the things he's talking about are reflected in what I've been talking about in terms of goals, structure, and attention. But I think one of the things that also comes through is at the end of the day, it comes down to people. So managers and companies compared to entrepreneurs and startups are actually operating typically in, a, in, a, in slightly different ways. And uh, a professor called Howard Stevenson, uh, who was one of the pioneers of teaching entrepreneurship in the MBA classroom at Harvard, basically says that managers and big companies start with resources and their job is to manage these resources <laughs> optimally. Whereas what entrepreneurs do is they start with an opportunity regardless of the resources they have and their job is to assemble the resources they need, the people, the money, um, the partners and so on. And I think that's also very much at the heart of what's different uh, and what makes it challenging managers and entrepreneurs um, are sort of driving at things rather differently. You start the book writing about Microsoft's capabilities and partnering with startup companies, and we've started this conversation. Could you walk us through the program uh, called BizSpark and their process and talk about some of their success stories? Sure. So um, in terms of the timeline of my work, I mentioned how in 2006, I got this notion of dancing with gorillas. Um, and then 2008, I had this paper come out called Dancing with Gorillas. And most of those early examples that I wrote about were happy accidents, you know, a very enterprising startup entrepreneur, you know, having the, the guts to um, find a way to talk to a large company or unusually entrepreneurial manager in a big company engaging with a, with a startup. 2008 is when Microsoft introduced this BizSpark <coughs> program. And, you know, for me, that heralded the, a, a move from more ad hoc to more systematic ways of engaging with startups. Now, Microsoft had, for many years, even before that, very consciously developed a partner ecosystem uh, because, of course, that was very crucial for their revenue model. They needed partners uh, to help implement their solutions uh, and also to build solutions on top of their platform technologies. And so they were, uh, they had for a while developed a way of dealing with what they called independent software vendors. But these tended to be more established companies, even the smaller ones. If you were a startup, it was actually challenging. Uh, to engage with Microsoft through the independent software vendor program. And they were also aware of the open software movement. Uh, they wanted to incentivize uh, startups to work with Microsoft tools. So the BizSpark program that was introduced in 2008 was essentially giving away free software tools to startups that were within the first three years of operations and had uh, less than a million dollar of revenues. Uh, so that's basically what BizSpark was, and it was um, managed by the uh, 
Silicon Valley campus of Microsoft, which was headed by Dana Lewin, a well-known personality in Silicon Valley. But very quickly, as you know, <coughs> thousands of startups signed up. Uh, you know, within a couple of years, it was like thirty thousand startups signed up to this. Uh, it became clear to Microsoft that they could actually do much more. You know, so they called this the breadth engagement but then they were interested to have some depth engagement too. And so uh, within a couple of years, they started working with the hundred most innovative startups from amongst the 30,000 BizPark startups and, and created this program called BizPark One, which was an invitation only program. Uh, and they were trying to figure out how to, to, to work with them more closely with the goal of helping them to have a go-to-market strategy, uh, which would be beneficial for the startup, but would also help Microsoft because Microsoft's underlying technologies that were used by the startup for their solutions would also uh, get used. And so that was, uh, I would say, the early stages of how Microsoft got into startup partnering in a more systematic, organized way. I, I would say that was the genius of Microsoft. If they had not done that, uh, they may not be who they are today. And they gave them a great lead over Apple because Steve Jobs was totally against doing that, right? I mean, that was so brilliant to go and do it. Maybe they just stumbled on it, or maybe it was a really thought out strategy, but it turned out to be brilliant because once you started developing for their platform, everybody had to use their platform to use accounting software, almost everything that we do today is essentially on a Microsoft platform. Even Apple's very small uh, in terms of all the different tools that we're all using on a day-to-day -day basis. I just think it was uh, really, really genius uh, that they did that. Did, did Microsoft or do, do they have a training program for managers to understand and work with startups? And how does that work? You know, uh... Before I, I respond to that, I just want to pick up on something you just said, because the, the contrast you made with Apple is so interesting. Uh, and, you know, the last time that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs appeared in public, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was at the uh, D conference in 2007. And, you know, you can find the, the video of them being interviewed by a couple of journalists on stage uh, jointly uh, on YouTube. And at the end, when there are uh, question uh, the the Q and A session. Another journalist asked this question of each of the of Gates and Jobs. What could you have learned from the other? And Jobs basically says, uh, at Apple we tried to build the whole banana, whereas um, Gates and Microsoft were much more consciously trying to partner with other companies. And I think uh, that helped them very much. And so, um, in terms of uh, training, I think because they were all, always sort of very partner centric and they had they still have this annual partner conference which attracts more than 15,000 people so there are very few uh, cities in the US that have convention halls large enough to host right. an event like this uh, you know these uh, i think um, needed to 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 add to this group this uh, startup uh, layer and uh, to some extent i think it would have needed um, managers to be socialized in this process. But I, 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 I think to a large extent, what happened was because again, um, as you say, you know, Microsoft made some uh, smart choices and smart decisions. One of the things that they decided to do was to take a big bet on cloud computing. And so at the 2011 Worldwide Partner Conference of Microsoft, the newly appointed president of the server and tool business got up and said, you know, cloud computing is where it's at and uh, we want to get uh, more of our partners working on it. And uh, his name, as it happens, is Satya Nadella, who then went on to become CEO in 2014. And so I think what really happened is that working with startups very quickly moved into the mainstream or moved quickly enough into the mainstream of their strategic thinking, which was to move the company towards cloud computing and so on. Uh, and so uh, in as much as there was training around this new approach uh, or this new business model, 
it became apparent that it was important to be engaging with these startup partners. And I think the really clever move was Nadella, after he became CEO, <laughs> ensured that the sales folks had, uh, in, were incentivized equally to sell Microsoft solutions and partner solutions because both would result in Microsoft Azure being consumed, you know, the cloud solution being consumed. And so I think that the internal culture shift, which in turn made startups seem like allies. Yeah, I, I think that was you know, incredibly brilliant on their part. Uh, what was the profile, the type of companies uh, Microsoft partnered with and what kind of cash or in-kind investments and mentoring uh, do they provide? So, so that's very interesting because I think um, there's been a sort of uh, an evolution there. So when they started with BizSpark, of course, they were saying, we're giving away these uh, software tools. And so BizSpark one was a subset of those. So if you were working on some Microsoft technologies, they were sort of supporting you. And in those early days, it was um, the emphasis was much more on giving away these free software tools. And then they made that a sort of a formal package of, I don't know, $125,000 worth of free cloud credits or that kind of thing. Then they tried to, uh, then they introduced an accelerator program. And in fact, the Israel team uh, played a big role in this. They, you know, very intrapreneurially came up with an accelerator program out of Israel, and then it became a global program, which in fact, the Israel team led by Zach Weisfeld led, um, and they set up uh, accelerators in China, India, Western Europe, and, and the US. Uh, and then, you know, the, the amount of resources that were given to the startups that came into the accelerator became even more. It was sort of went up to even something like $250,000 worth of credits. And what they were also saying is they would not invest in these startups. And this was sold as one of the attractive features, which was that entrepreneurs uh, did not have to get diluted to join the Microsoft Accelerator. Um, and then when this happened, they actually was trying to say we are very technology agnostic. So, you know, we're open to startups working on anything, um, working on any platform. In fact, the first time I walked into a Microsoft Accelerator, I was shocked to see Apple Macintosh machines on the desks of the, the startups. And this was when Barmer was still in charge, when they were not that open to, to other ecosystems. Uh, but over time, I think, then they figured that they should really support the ones working on Microsoft Azure more. So, you know, the, the profile has changed over time in a couple of ways, I think. One, uh, they have become much more focused now on the types of startups that they think they can add value to and see value from. So it's, it, it's enterprise uh, software companies and now increasingly more mature ones with solutions they can take to enterprise customers and ones that are using and are committed to the, the Microsoft ecosystem. In reality, I think that's um, where they've moved towards. And uh, I think many startups have, have benefited from this. They found it um, found that you know, it's, it's helped them to accelerate the, the scale up uh, process in particular and get access to corporate uh, clients. I mean, it's not like every single story has a happy ending uh, for sure. Uh, but, you know, I think um, across different geographies, it's been clear that uh, many startups have benefited from the, the, the partnership. I, I, over the years, I've heard many companies talk about these programs at uh, Microsoft, and it's actually helped them raise investor capital. And I wonder how many companies benefited by this program that were able to raise outside capital. Do you know if they've ever studied that? Yes, yes. And uh, I, I can't uh, remember the, the number offhand, but this is a number that they would uh, constantly talk about, the amount of capital raised by the accelerator cohorts, say, within a month of graduating or three months of graduating. And, and it was always very impressive. And in fact, there was a very interesting subtle difference between the startups in, in advanced markets and the ones in emerging markets. You know, so 
Um, the ones in advanced markets, uh, Microsoft would um, invite startups that had already got some sort of funding from a VC. So that would help the st startup to stand out. They would come into the Microsoft Accelerator and then subsequently be able to raise the next round. But in the emerging markets in the early days in China and India, it was the VCs were paying attention to who Microsoft was inviting into their accelerators and then deciding to invest in those even for the early rounds. And you know, this was in the, in the early days when uh, it wasn't so clear to, to VCs which startups yeah. were worth investing in. So yeah. So in a way, Microsoft was picking the winners and losers right. um, early on on a global basis. Absolutely. The companies whose partnerships have failed, uh, which you write about, and I'm not talking about Microsoft, I'm talking about in general, you, you talk about this, uh, companies who've done these kinds of partnerships. Why did they, and what can be learned from this? So I think um, there are a couple of things to, to bear in mind. So in terms of the how I mentioned already, the uh, synergy interface exemplar framework. And I think the companies that haven't been able to work this out and not do this very systematically uh, have had problems. But I think there's also been failure in another aspect of the how, which is a failure to actually embed this as a organizational capability. And in, with regard to that, I talk about initiation, expansion, and systematization. So I think getting started is actually sometimes a big challenge. You know, people have an idea that uh, they should be able to uh, do something to work with uh, startups, but there's internal resistance or you know a difficulty to to get resources. So very often the companies that I've studied have had some entrepreneurial manager who's found a way to get started, but when companies have not been able to get to the next stage of expanding it, that's where a lot of these things have fizzled out. And this is where a different skill set has been important, which is to get buy-in from within the company. So if the um, uh, synergy interface exemplar framework is very much about the external facing aspect of working with startups, I would say initiation, expansion, systematization has a lot to do with how the internal realities of a big company are dealt with. And particularly in terms of expansion, I think uh, when managers are able to skillfully get support from you know, the higher ups, from business unit managers, and then just you know, much larger set of people within the company who are supportive of this, you know, that makes all the difference. And, and that has been a big difference between the ones who've succeeded and, and, and have, have failed. And finally, it's that systematization piece, meaning engaging with startups becomes strategically important. And I, I gave the example of Microsoft and cloud computing, or in the case of Bayer, for example, you know, as they systematized their startup partnering and could link it to priorities that they were working on in pharma, for example, and then looking for corresponding digital health expertise from the startups, you know, that's when it becomes successful. And in this process, sometimes the, the people in the company who are involved at the systematization stage are not necessarily the ones who help to initiate it because maybe a different skill set is required, uh, you know, as startup partnering becomes much more embedded within the fabric of the company. A couple of things, uh, questions here is, one is do the leadership or managers and vice presidents, you know, all these different divisions, how are they financially incented to make sure that these partnerships work? Because I can't tell you how many times I've worked with entrepreneurs and they said, oh, I've signed a partnership with HP or whatever. And I say, those partnerships are pretty much worthless unless the salespeople are highly incented to sell your product. Because you know, HP would have this book of like 30,000 or 100,000 different products. Great to be in that book, but if they never open that book and show it to their clients, it means absolutely nothing to have that partnership. It's nice to say, but nothing really happens. So how do they incentivize them to do that? 
Yeah, that see, that's a great question. So, you know, in terms of the synergy itself, uh, I think it's important to be clear, both from the perspective of the big company, but also the startups that are trying to engage with the big company as to what the synergy is. I think the um, IT companies, the, the more digitally native companies, typically have a sort of a building block synergy. They have these techno technology building blocks. They want the startups to leverage this in some way. And then there's a pro the prospect of co-selling. Uh, and as I mentioned in the case of Microsoft, but I've also seen this for SAP, you know, when sales forces are incentivized to sell partner solutions uh, in the same way as they are to sell the, the company's own solutions, and this is more likely when there is cloud computing involved and so on, uh, that's when it really becomes meaningful. Although the startups have to be realistic and realize that they have to be one of the more highly acclaimed uh, startup partner solutions to be able to get the visibility of the of the company and uh, you know so from the startup's point of view uh, it's a question of then actually getting visibility with the right people in the company making sure the solutions are seen that they are uh, well aligned with what the big company uh, wants to do the other type of uh, synergy i've seen mainly with uh, more traditional industry companies, automotive, banking, um, consumer goods, and so on, is more of a pain point type of synergy. You know, they have challenges that they want the startups to uh, provide solutions for, typically using digital capabilities. And again, it's, you know, when those pain points are truly addressed, um, either meaning that some costs are being saved or some new opportunities are, are possible. Again, that's when you know, the, the companies are truly incentivized to, to do something useful with this. So for example, Walmart ended up working with a startup from Shenzhen here in China to smoothen the process of buying loose vegetables and fruits uh, by you know, using artificial intelligence to uh, make it more painless for consumers to get their product weighed and get a sticky label. But then they worked out that that technology could also be used back in the US, but to deal with a very different solution, uh, or rather a very different pain point, which was in-store theft. So again, it's, I think, um, comes down to is value truly being added? And uh, you know that's how I think meaningful outcomes can accrue. So it's, I think, less about the, the program per se, and more about, you know, is genuine value added? Uh, in the pharmaceutical biotech area, uh, these partnerships are what makes these large companies succeed at the end of the day. And of course, the funding is absolutely essential for the startups. I once toured uh, a major pharmaceutical company, a CEO showed me around, and he showed me that at five o'clock, a lot of his employees were in the company gym working out. And he said, this is why I invest in startups is because I know they're working 15 hours a day, seven days a week. And then they don't look and say, oh my gosh, we're sitting on 4 billion in cash. We got time where these guys are running out of time. How does that work? Why does it work so well in that field? And, and it, you know, the majors couldn't exist without these startups. What's your you know, take on that? It, it's so interesting. So in the past, you know, in the early days of my research, if I would talk to people and say, I'm looking at how big companies partner with startups, if they were from the IT industry, they'd go, hmm, interesting. If they were from the automotive industry, they'd look at me like I was mad because the only way they could think about these partnerships were very vertical supply chain kind of relationships. They had SME, automotive suppliers, who they tried to control. But if I mentioned this to people from the pharma industry, they were the ones that seemed to have the most enlightened view about dealing with vastly different types of partners, because as you say, they were doing this with biotech and you know, the, probably the only clear success story that's come out of COVID has been with vaccines. And you know, even what Pfizer was able to do was by working with a small, biotech company in Germany. So I think um, this is one of the, the industries that worked out uh, the 
earliest that there are these complementary cap capabilities that can be brought together. But I think what has been the, the additional layer that uh, my research picked up is how pharma companies recognize the prospect of working with digital health startups. Uh, and this has actually meant dealing with a much larger pool of startups, maybe having relationships that aren't necessarily as resource uh, intensive as when a pharma company works with a biotech company, um, you know, uh, to take to market some drug or, or whatever. So you're talking about a much bigger numbers game, but certainly they've had a very enlightened view on things and also a greater sense of urgency to be talking to them. So one of the pharma executives I interviewed in Silicon Valley, uh, a German executive working for Bayer there, he said, I want to talk to startups before I read about them in Inc. magazine, uh, because that way I can actually shape what they're doing to suit our needs more and they can benefit um, from getting a sort of an uplift working with a corporate client early on. Yeah, I, I think that's been really smart. I, I read recently that Procter & Gamble, I think it was Procter & Gamble, said that 25% of their new products come from partnerships with startups. Absolutely. I mean, so Unilever is one of the companies I talk about in the book, but Procter & Gamble uh, is the other great example of this. And in fact, the guy who helped set up um, one of the early initiatives at Procter & Gamble, which encouraged them to look outside of the company uh, for solutions and so on, has ended up setting up his own uh, consultancy in the Bay Area. And he was describing to me how basically by talking to uh, external partners, they find either solutions to pain points or additional opportunities. So, so one of the examples that I learned from him was how you know, their sales of diapers were flatlining and they were trying to find new markets. And one of the things that came to light was uh, an underserved market with, with these um, daycare centers where little children were, were spending say the best part of the day while the parents were at work, uh, but there was no systematic way of dealing with uh, the diaper needs of, of these entities. And then they ended up engaging with the startup uh, to uh, develop a solution that was uh, tailored for that particular market. And uh, so um, I think, uh, I believe what you're saying. And, and, and I think this is of course also, it speaks to this, process of you know people initiating these programs but then getting more buy-in so that it becomes something that it, it's second nature it's because the the big challenge of course is the not invented here syndrome and so you know the fact that you get the idea from a startup uh, isn't necessarily um, you know uh, or shouldn't be perceived as an insult of what's happening within the company uh, because at the end of the day, the company can benefit and grow. I mean, we we have, there's tons of examples of people who left big companies because they couldn't get their idea through yeah. in the big company, went on, started their own, and they built billion dollar companies. I mean, the guy from Zoom, he actually created uh, Cisco's product. He went to them and said, I got a better product. They said, no, we're fine with this. And who cares about Cisco's product anymore? when everybody is using Zoom or WebEx or something like that. But essentially, Zoom has become the de facto, uh, de facto platform for most everybody, right? You would say, hey, I'm going to set you. Let's do a Zoom. They're not right. saying anything else. I think that's really fascinating mm -hmm. about how that's worked out. Um, how should a CEO of a startup uh, put themselves in a position where a big company wants to partner with them and possibly invest? What, what do you do to set yourself up for that kind of success? You know, so I actually started writing for the startup audience when I was, when I did this article, Dancing with Gorillas, and uh, I, I do still, um, I'm very interested to uh, talk to this community, but the, the better I understood what the gorillas were doing, the better I understand, I think, how startups can succeed. So in this early paper of mine, I talk about three steps from the perspective of the startup. You know, you must form the relationship, you must consolidate the relationship, and then seek to extend the relationship if it, if it makes sense to do so. 
Uh, what I've understood now better is that actually when you take into account what the big company is doing in terms of synergy, it gives the startup CEO a better idea of A, whether to even try to form the relationship or not. So is, is the big company, first of all, clear about what the synergy is? And if they are, does it really make sense for us? Uh, understanding what the interface, the nature of the partner interface, is it more of an accelerator type thing or is it more of an innovation challenge type thing where they're trying to screen out startups, not necessarily build a community? Which of these fits us better in terms of consolidating the relationship? Because each of those approaches have pros and cons. And then what type of exemplars are these big companies trying to create? Because that gives us the idea of whether we want to be an exemplar, we, we can be a success story, because that's when you're most likely to be able to expand the relationship to other business units. That being said, I would also say from the startup's point of view, that for each of these three steps, forming, consolidating, and extending, it's important to, and this might sound contradictory, but I think it's important to hold these contradictory tensions. It's important to, on the one hand, put your best foot forward and uh, seek to make a good impression, while at the same time being cautious uh, and careful. So you know you need a healthy dose of optimism and pessimism at the same time. So for example, in terms of forming the relationship, you do wanna be proactive, use connections to be able to, to uh, create the relationship. But at the same time, you wanna be really clear that the big company is genuinely interested because otherwise it can be a waste of time. In terms of consolidating the relationship, it's important I think for the startup to focus on their area of strength, the area of core strength, to not get distracted by tangential opportunities because you get only one, op one chance to make a, a good first impression. But at the same time, you need to be cautious and, and engage in a process of selective revealing because the trick is, you know, you need to show enough for the big company to be interested, but not so much that they don't need you anymore. Uh, and then in terms of extending the relationship, I mean, actively look for possibilities to engage with other geographies or other business units of the, in the way that that startup in Shenzhen worked with Walmart in China and then with Walmart in America. But at the same time, build a set of options, you know, not necessarily put all your eggs in one basket. And so I think a healthy dose of optimism and pessimism is, is needed. And just the very final thing I'll say on this is, I think one of the reasons why that phrase dancing with gorillas resonated with a lot of people is that it hints at the prospect of danger. You can get trampled when you are engaging with a big company. So here, two questions in a sense. One is um, how do you make sure you don't get trampled uh, by these folks? And two is shouldn't you have be dancing with a couple of gorillas? Because if yeah. you're only dancing with one, those guys can, uh, and this happened to me in one of my own ventures. It took two years to close the deal. And I was kicking, it, it worked out fine in the sense they were a terrific partner. But if I'd been dealing with two or three, I could have closed that deal in months, not years. Yeah. And I, and I made the mistake of kind of so, signing an agreement that gave, uh, made this almost exclusive while we were negotiating. Yeah, exactly. This. So, uh, and I learned a big lesson from that. So talk about that. Yeah, I think that that I think this is one of the key issues, you know, being very careful with exclusivity deals um, and recognizing that, uh, you know, permanence is not necessarily going to be the state of play. And so the kinds of uh, agreements that are developed and I think looking for the sort of company that is actually interested in the welfare of the startup from an enlightened self-interest point of view. So, for example, BMW have made it very clear now to startup partners, any IP that's developed in the process of working together will belong to the startup. And I think that gives a lot of assurance to a startup. And from BMW's point of view, I think what they've figured is it's actually in many cases far more legal hassle to deal with IP and IP sharing and so on. It's far simpler if you're trying to develop a pilot project to say improve uh, cyber security in the, for the cars or, or autonomous driving performance, uh, you know, just let the, the startups 
uh, hang on to the IP. And so BMW also realizes they're competing with Volvo, they're competing with other um, car companies to attract the best startup partners. So I think that's also partly the due diligence startups need to do. You know, does the big company really take startup partnering seriously? Here's a question from the audience. Um, uh, from the corporate side that have less structured external collaboration frameworks, there can be significant resistance to bring in external ideas, even if they clearly close a gap. Any critical learnings from Microsoft or others on what they did that enabled smooth partnering or tech transfer into the organization from the startup so others in the large corporation could see the value in working with the startup idea versus driving their own internal capability? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it's a combination of uh, sort of bottom up and top down initiatives and how they came together that helped Microsoft. So on the one hand, Daniel Lewin as a very senior Microsoft executive who was brought in specifically to drive Silicon Valley engagement, you know, he and his team setting up Bis BizPark and BizPark Plus, uh, BizPark One, uh, these kinds of very corporate top-down events. First of all, it was a very clear signal. We are taking startups uh, seriously and they were showcasing success stories. But then you had the team in Israel, which a couple of years later came up with their accelerator program, which ultimately got taken up as the um, global model. But why they were taken seriously was they were able to showcase a handful of successful startups that um, you know, were clearly able to work well with Microsoft in a way that helped uh, both sides. Uh, and then what also finally happened was the Satya Nadella involvement, you know, being the guy who even before he became CEO uh, was driving cloud computing. And then as CEO felt this was a big strategic priority. And so it's this combination of signaling from the top that this is important and people from the trenches being um, empowered to come up with ways to engage with startups and showcase these success stories. I think either on its own is insufficient. If it's just a very top-down thing, uh, which doesn't get commitment from middle managers, it's not really going to take off. And if it's only the middle managers trying to do things entrepreneurially, then you will be able to initiate a lot of things but it just never gets going in terms of being expanded and systematized. And so it's that combination of the top managers and the middle managers that's important. And, and you know, uh, if one is not in the C-suite, then that can be frustrating because that's not within your control. Uh, but I think eventually that becomes really, really important. And so for middle managers to engage in some issue selling, to, to try and persuade uh, the C-suite, and sometimes it's it comes down to finding one key internal champion within the top team who then can help uh, to, to, to get things going and build momentum. Is there a difference between the experiences of B2C and B2B when it comes to connecting with startups? Yes, I think so in terms of um, which companies are interested to, talk, to talking to them and sort of the nature of the engagement. And so Microsoft, for example, very much talking to B2B uh, enterprises, but uh, some of the startups in, uh, or rather some of the companies in other uh, sectors uh, in the consumer space, for example, just as interested to talk to B2C uh, um, startups as well. So from that point of view, I think, for who it makes sense to be engaging with these partnerships, both from the startup side and the corporate side can be a little bit different. But I think in terms of the broad principles that you will have these asymmetries and you need to address them, uh, my expectation and my observation is that there's no commonality there. You know, every company has gotten into the hackathons, right? I mean, once a couple of companies do and they have some success, everybody wants to do it. How successful have these hackathons been in terms of identifying, investing, and eventually partnering or acquiring startups? I think a complete waste of time when there has been no 
real intent backing these or where there's been no follow up. And that goes back to, you know, where you have a lot of initiation of these activities, but very little follow up in terms of expanding on these and systematizing this. But a lot of success when this has led to other things. And in fact, the startup that I described having partnered with Walmart really came into Walmart's orbit through a hackathon event, uh, which, were, which helped them to identify a few potential partners. And then they ended up working with the startup over a two month period and then over the next several months as well. And so I think it really comes down to what the hackathon is being used for, how serious the company is to be able to, to follow up uh, thereafter. And uh, again, I think it really is about are they able to build a capability around startup partnering? How many times have we heard this story? A big concern of entrepreneurs, and, and you, as I said, you read this all the time. After they're acquired, they feel like they're being suffocated by the big company's uh, need for control. What can entrepreneurs do to protect themselves and succeed after an acquisition? I mean, certainly that was a big complaint with the WhatsApp uh, founders. And even though they became instant billionaires, they weren't really that happy being at Microsoft, at um, Facebook. Yeah, that I think is a, a, a major conundrum. And I think uh, it's one of those issues that doesn't have a, a simple answer. I think, first of all, the, the entrepreneur needs to be clear about their intent in terms of what they are uh, looking for. I think some companies, some startup founders are very happy to have the exit. A lot of the startups I met in Israel, the founders weren't necessarily looking to scale those up. They were quite happy to have them acquired by a big multinational and then move on to their next thing. Others were much more um, committed to growing the companies themselves uh, and in some cases actually resisted acquisition uh, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, robust sort of way. But uh, some of the other companies in between, I think, you know, it's, it's one of these things that's very hard to predict how things will work out. And so, you know, a lot of it is, I think, down to negotiation and the things that you uh, agree. Uh, but the happiest endings I've seen are ones where there's been a very sort of limited, uh, anticipated engagement. So one of the early startups that I was studying that worked with Microsoft got acquired by another big company, which was in fact a very close uh, <laughs> partner of Microsoft, not no Microsoft itself, but another major company. And I think the startup founders were very clear. They committed to working with this large uh, company that acquired <laughs> them for a two year period. It worked out really well. And at the end of that two year period, the big company was in a position to take on the operations without needing these two people. And these two people were ready to move on to the next thing. And so maybe, you know, for some founding teams, that sort of limited engagement will work. Um, okay. we, have, we have a couple of minutes left and I have two big, uh, two questions. One is being acquired as a startup or, or actually partnering as a startup uh, around the world is are different countries different experiences for startups? Like, you know, if I'm starting a startup in France and I want to partner with a large company in France, is that a different experience than a startup in the US partnering with a US company? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, the book talks about the why, the how, and the where of startup partnering. And in terms of the where, I think there's less of a pronounced difference between France and the US, although there's likely to be a difference, uh, than there's likely to be between, say, the France and US on the one hand and China and India on the other. In other words, I think that there are bigger differences between advanced markets and emerging markets. Um, and the difference is that in emerging markets, there's a huge appetite for entrepreneurship and a leapfrogging of technology. So in many cases, you know, the PC era has been leapfrogged and a lot of very innovative users of mobile internet technology. But on the other hand, the ecosystems in some, in a sense, are less mature. You don't have the kind of serial entrepreneurs you find in Silicon Valley or Israel in uh, say uh, Shenzhen or Bangalore, you're more likely to find these first time entrepreneurs. And I think that's where a little bit more handholding 
has been useful and important on the part of the large companies. There's also another distinction that can be made between these uh, high reputation clusters, uh, the well-known hotspots and the not so well-known places. You know, Glasgow and Scotland, for example, I think is where partnering with startups would be very different than partnering in Silicon Valley or, or even in emerging market um, uh, markets where in, in towns and cities that are off the beaten track. In places like those, I have found that when there are entrepreneurial government officials, policy makers, who either create policies to bring together companies and startups or leverage existing programs, like for example, a smart city uh, initiative, uh, that's when it's still possible, even in these locations, surprisingly, to have some fruitful partnerships. And my book has a few examples of those. Okay, so less than 60 seconds here. Uh, what's the trend going to be? Are we going to see more of these kinds of partnerships or less? I actually think we're going to see more, but I think they're going to be more sophisticated. I think big companies are going to be taking, paying attention to the return on their effort and also trying to win the hearts and minds of startups and recognizing that they need to build a reputation for being good partners. I think there's going to be more synergy between uh, corporate venture capital and non-equity partnering. And an interesting trend that's developing is corporate venture studios, where some companies are actually trying to help create startups from the ground up to become partners uh, to those companies. Shamin, I guess we could have spent the rest of the day with you talking about this subject. Thank you so much for coming on today. Your book is terrific. People really get some good insights into the thinking of large companies and how best to work with them. So I encourage everybody to get this book if you're looking to partner with large companies. Certainly it would have saved me when I did my partnership <laughs> uh, twice with two different large companies for two different ventures. Everybody have a wonderful, safe week and enjoy. And uh, Shamin, again, thank you. We look forward to your next book. Thank you so much. Enjoy talking with you, Mark. Take care. Bye-bye. Yes, bye-bye.